Welcome to the Metal Voice, and first time on the show, it's Buck. It's yeah. Buck Dharma from Blue Oyster Cult. So right. nice to have you. Not looking very metal today, but that's that's me. It's all good, my friend. Yeah. Um, the good news is a Blue Oyster Cult coming out with a new album, Ghost Stories, going to come out on April the 12th on a Frontiers Music, a reimagined, newly completed songs that span from... 1978 to 2016. That, that, right. That's pretty incredible. I mean, it is. Yep. Whose idea was this to take all the tracks from the past and sort of twist them and turn them and AI them and make them into songs today? Yeah. Well, BOC historically didn't record a lot of extra material that didn't fit on a vinyl LP, which, you know, had a runtime of about 40 minutes maximum, you know. Mm -hmm. If CDs had been around at the time, all these songs would have gone on the CD, but uh, they were they were fallow. And uh, the most of the source material is, were pre-production recordings done by our live sound mixer, uh, George Geranius. And uh, the, a lot of them are eight track analog. Some were direct to stereo, but but. Uh, some of the source tapes had deteriorated as uh, the tape formulations of the of that time were famous for and um, had to be uh, resurrected or in some cases re-recorded. And mm -hmm. we, we you know, Frontiers was was clamoring for some more product. You know, we just had had the uh, the three night Sony Hall per live performances of the first three records and 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 uh, bonus tracks and uh, with uh, original drummer Albert Bouchard in the on the stage too. So, but they wanted more stuff, so uh, we got this idea to do it. So you used AI to reconstruct the songs or to yeah, fix the, the quality. The AI of actually demixes. Um, a stereo recording okay. and lets you have more control over the individual elements, the drums, the bass, and the vocals specifically. Guitars are a little harder to uh, yeah. extract. I, I think I think what it does is it, it it sort of separates the tracks of the, right? It's right, yeah. It gives you a little more individual control as if you were dealing with a multi-track uh, sound, yeah. Which, which song from this new album did you have the most difficulty uh, recreating or reimaging? I don't know because it was done by Richie Castellano in Staten Island. And, okay. Uh, he did most of the tech work on this, you know, with uh, Steve Shank as producer. Which song then I'll ask you, are you happy that it's been sort of rebuilt and brought out for today? Um, I, I, I like the, uh, I like the one that I sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I like that because that, you know, that was a Albert Bouchard song that he asked me to do the vocal on and, and it, it, it didn't make the record. And now when I hear it, I said, Oh, I wish that I'd made the record. And, and a cool thing is kick out the jams, which is, you know, a cover that you did back or you play yeah. live. Right. And now yeah. you have finally a studio version of it. How did that come about? Yeah. Um, we, I don't know if we were playing that for fun or do we actually consider putting it on the record, but I think it's a really good version. And it's especially, you know, now that the MC5 are gone, you know, it's, it's just, I feel really sort of affectionate and uh, nostalgic for the, for the whole MC5 thing. You know, Wayne Kramer just passed away. Yeah. Actually, it's a great version and I'm happy that it's included on this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, I think we, we uh, could be proud of what we did. Yeah. What was it like working with Albert, uh, the Bouchard brothers, uh, Joe and Albert, uh, all these years? I mean, I guess it's been on and off, right? I mean. Yeah. 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 Which, you know, we, we've had some collaboration over the years since they left the band, but uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah right. we've done quite a lot with Albert, and this is the first time we've we've done stuff with Joe in in a long time. Um, do you see this as the last album by Blue Oyster Cult, or you think you got a few, another one left in you? As far as promises, it's the last one, but you know, in in, in reality, I don't know. 
perhaps there'll be more stuff. You know, <laughs> I guess Richie if reinvigorates stop, you. If we, yeah, if we stop recording, we might get restless. You know, what can I say? I don't. know. How many dates a year do you do on tour? We did seventy-five in the fiftieth anniversary, which is twenty-two, and then last year we did about thirty, and we're going to do less this year. And uh, you know, we may we may want to tour again, but uh, I'm thinking I'd, I'd like to just not tour for a while. So we'll see how that goes. Is, is that like a, a pause a or a break. retirement? What's that? Is that a pause or a retirement? Um. As long as I can play and sing, I'll probably want to, you know, be out there some somewhere, you know. But uh, as far as the the grind of of making a living at it, you know, it's, I don't have to. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, let me ask you. Like we started off with, hey, I'm not looking very heavy metal today. What's the connection between Blue Oyster Cult and heavy metal? There's always been that connection. I, yeah, well, I think the term was coined right about the time that we got started. And also, uh, you know, we admired Black Sabbath. And, and you know, I think uh, when we were starting, we were casting about for an image, you know, because we were the soft white underbelly before Blue Oyster Cult, you know. And I, I always thought of the underbelly as the last of the East Coast psychedelic bands, you know, we... So you know we're, we're sort of a jam band, you know, more than a than a uh, a metal band. Certainly, what metal has become is nothing like what BOC is, of course. Did you at one time consider yourselves a metal band back in the day in the early seventies? Only, but be, only before the 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 term was really defined by the bands that followed us. It's interesting because the movie Heavy Metal, which actually had nothing to do with heavy metal, but it sort of right. inspired everybody. Blue Oyster Cult, you know, you had a song on heavy metal. I yeah. Mean, when you look back now at that movie and your contributions, you think it was the right song or the right, or maybe the movie didn't hold up well over time? Yeah. I, uh, well, I think uh, Veteran of the Psychic Wars is actually a great song. And I think it, it fit in the movie, you know, fine. And um, we had actually all written songs for submission to that movie and um some of them were, were came out on uh on uh other boc records so yeah no but, even even the song heavy metal wasn't in the movie right Based right on the same album right on uh yeah yeah actually i don't know if that was part of the uh as part of the the effort i guess it was yeah yeah, I mean, you would think heavy metal would be with heavy metal. Strange right. enough, that magazine inspired the movie in that right. magazine. Well, yeah. well, that was a Sandy Perlman lyric, you know, heavy metal, the black and silver. And uh, he he might have coined the phrase. You know, I don't know. I'd never heard it before he said it, you know, and, and applied it to us as our, as a as a defining descriptor, you know. So... Did anybody say heavy metal before us? I don't know if they did. You know, I think we were the first umlaut band. But we, we've, I've talked, we've spoken to Albert, you know, a few times, and you know, we always talk about, you know, the the big songs, the Godzillas. I, mean, I know you've spoken about these songs so many times, but do you think that sort of fractured the band because you were the big hit maker of the band? You had that voice. Your 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 songs were the ones that sort of took the band over the top. Did that cause sort of friction in the band at the time? Well, we all sang in Blue Oyster Cult, you know, and and Eric Bloom is the prime singer, and he was the he was the you know the 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 shouter and the growler, you know, the, in putting across the heavy stuff. And uh, I'm more of a crooner myself, but uh, it's just the way it worked. Once the Reaper was a hit, the whole band wanted to write hits, you know, and I and I think that that actually. Uh, you know, was was not the best um, strategy for the band, but you can't blame everybody for wanting the hits, and the record company certainly wanted hits. You know, so we became a lot more pop oriented, I think, in in response to having a pop hit. When you came to the band and you said, "I got a song called Godzilla," what did they say to you? Um, yeah, okay, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> if it, if there was any song that was close yeah. to metal, that would be it. Yeah, well, you know, I I did a demo in my basement, and the the demo basically is you know conveyed the the song as as it was recorded. You know, same with 
Don't Fear the Reaper. You know, it's very similar to my demo. A any plans to re-release the uh, the black and blue show that everybody is always talking about? On uh, I guess it was released in two thousand, but and, you know, a new yeah. version of it. I don't know who has the rights to that. We don't. You know, so. All right. So you haven't heard anything about anyone. I had heard that that uh, that. Uh, that Ozzy and his camp didn't want that out. Although, you know, Ozzy's not on that. It's Ronnie Dio. But, you know, who, there's, who's ever suppressing that is is not us. Okay. Yeah. I remember my friends in Milwaukee at the time, you know, everything was being torn up. Uh, if you remember what happened there, uh, there was yeah. uh, there was like 160 arrests, I think. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we had played our show. You know, we were supporting Sabs at the time, and uh, when when the hell started to break loose, you know, we got out of the building. So I didn't even I just saw it on television, basically at the at the afterward of that. Any thoughts on uh, Ronnie James Dio? You know, seeing him perform at the time that was his heyday. You know, it was yeah, sort of yeah. I saw Ronnie play a fraternity house in Cortland. You know, <laughs> actually it was in Geneva, New York. He was from Cortland. Yeah. Because uh, I went to college upstate New York with Albert, and that's where I met Albert Bouchard. And uh, Eric Bloom went to Hobart in Geneva, and we went to Geneva and saw him play um, Tommy in a fraternity house. And you know, he's he was an incredible singer. He could he could mimic Tom Jones like Tom Jones. You know, he was just great. You know, so. Yeah, it was great to see Ronnie, you know, reach his prominence that he did. You know, he's he's always good. Um, going back to the album, um, like I hear late night street fight kind of reminds me of the revenge of Vera Gemini. Is that were there like little aspects of these these unfinished or now finished songs mm. that sort of made their way onto other albums? I don't know. Both those songs have uh, have the Bouchard Brothers shuffle groove, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, yes. it's like Albert and Joe when they're doing that that Vera Gemini and Street Fight shuffle beat. You know, it's really infectious. Like we got to get out of this place. You know, that sounds like classic BOC, probably in the mid seventies. Yeah. Um, you well, know, you, we used to that. play that as a club band. We used to play that song, you know, and and of course we love it. So you know, I'm glad that that version exists. How much is Richie? He seems to be like the conductor today, right? He's sort of like bringing it all together. What, what's his role today? Well, Richie's he's got a big talent stack. You know, he's he's a great player. He's very tech oriented. He's a good recordist. He's a good uh, video guy. He's uh, collaborating with uh, John Anderson now on on new uh, post yes Anderson material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know he's worth his weight in uh, platinum or diamonds or whatever you want to say. Um, Plutonium. He, he's with. He, 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 you know he's Ray touring Rack. with John Anderson. I think he's going to tour with him as well. Correct. Yeah, yeah. He did a tour last year and it went over like gangbusters. The the Yes fans just couldn't believe what they were hearing, you know, with the band geeks and with John. So they're doing more. Tell me about uh, Cultosaurus and, and working with Martin Birch, you know, on those two albums after and the one after. Yeah, that. yeah. I I feel very affectionate toward Martin and, and I'm sad he's gone. You know, he was, he was the most open and with his knowledge, you know, as far as teaching, you know, me how to, how to record at home and stuff like that. You know, he was just, uh, he was a great guy. Yeah. He it's was interesting. Not, he was great. You know, for Cultosaurus Erectus and Fire of Unknown Origin, when you put those two albums on, they seem to be the most consistent from start to finish. Is that like, would you agree with that compared I to? Think, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that's Martin in terms of, uh, you know, he engineered and produced and he, you know, he, he didn't have a heavy hand as a producer, but he, he would really, you know, if, if he thought something was important, he would, he would, you know, stand up for it, you know? So I think the coherence of his records are basically his doing. And, and tell me about Sandy Perlman, another great talent, you know, um, and his legacy in regards to always these obscure lyrics. Did you, 
when he came with you with these lyrics, did you sometimes know where he was going or you just would he explain them to you before you, you kind of made them into songs? Not really, no. Um, but, it, you know, they're just, they, they, they inspire your imagination. You know, he would not want to really give you a literal description of what he meant, you know, but uh, but the story aspect was just leapt off the pages, basically, you know, and Sandy's the reason why I'm a professional musician and a recording artist, you know, before meeting him, I, I was never self-motivated enough to consider doing it, you know, but uh, he he recognized uh my guitar talent and the, with the synergy of, of the elements of the, all the original guys and Sandy, it's uh, it made sense to really give professional music uh, a, a, uh, a shot, you know, it's, we, we felt like we could do it with all of us together. Um, tell me about what Metallica covering astronomy did to a, uh to Blue Oyster Cult's uh, credibility, I guess. Did, did I don't know. Yeah, it? It's, it gave us some cred with the with with the younger generation behind us. And, of course, we were very flattered when they did it. You know, it's nice to get some some recognition like that. I mean, I I love all the covers of our songs that, that, I, that people do, and there's a lot of them out there. You know, you know what's interesting about Astronomy? It's, it's a song that I always knew, but when Metallica covered it, then it just became that much bigger, right? It, yeah, I mean, I guess that record sold a lot, didn't it? <laughs> it did. Good song. It's a great song. Yeah. Um, do you think you'll ever live down the cowbell? No. <laughs> no, the cowbell is like a ball and chain around Blue Oyster Cult's ankle. <laughs> you know, um, and it's okay. You know, I've, I've long since you know not forgiven whatever you know um, connection we have. You know, it's I just accept it. Yeah. Don't fear the reaper. How many times a day is it played worldwide? Do you have any statistics? I don't know, but it's it, it's still it almost it's probably a bigger hit these days than it was in 1976. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's it, what what does the song mean to you today? I mean, like, is it just like you can't? It's not yours anymore. A lot of artists say once a song's so big, they feel that it's not theirs. It belongs to the world in a way. Well, it certainly has rippled out into the culture, you know. And at this point, it's it's a it's it's a eulogy and a tribute to people that are passing away. That's the way we, you know, we dedicate we dedicate it to uh, to people that have gone, you know, on a regular basis. It's, I want to play it at my funeral, you know. <laughs> have it on loop. I think I want to play Godzilla at mine. That's yeah, I'm go ahead. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome to it. Tell me. Um, any anything else that's going on with Blue Oyster Cult that you want to tell everybody about, with the exception of the new album that's coming out? Yeah. Okay. Well, we get ghost stories. We are touring. the 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 dates are fewer, so if you want to see us, I would recommend coming. You know, and uh, I've got a solo tune that's coming out uh, later this year, and okay. it's the first thing I've done solo since the '80s. And uh, going forward to the future. I would be surprised if you never heard anything more from us. You know, there'll probably will be something at some point, but uh, we are content to um, present what we have out right now. And um, we, uh, we still like what we do. All right. On that note, ghost stories coming out April the 12th, frontier records. Uh, frontier scary, music. Ghost stories. I'm sorry. It's creepy. It's very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look good, man. You look good. You look Thank good. You. you look you, you look good. Thank and, you, uh, you look good. Yeah. And uh, and I'm um, you know I'm 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 hoping one day you guys will come back to the eastern part of Canada for yeah. maybe a last show or something. Right. It, it it just takes a lot of money to get us up across the border. That's you know. yeah, yeah. We gotta we gotta figure something out. <laughs> on that note buck thank you so much for your time and uh yeah i well, wish talking. you all the best okay all right.